Son from heaven, Lord, to reconcile our sins to be with you forever. Help us to understand that more and appreciate that more and to fall more in love with you every day. And this is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, it has been a good, good news morning in a lot of ways, and I just want to continue that. It's good to be together, good to hear good things about others, and just to hear the good news. I always hesitate to, to single out anybody's participation uh, in our service. I mean, all the guys have done a great job in leading us today, uh, but I'm going to break my own rule and, and, and praise a little bit more Brother Dave for the way he led us in communion this morning, uh, the way his thoughts sort of focused us on that. I hesitate to say Brother Dave because I have a bad association with the title Brother Dave. When I, where I grew up, there was a preacher in town, sort of prominent preacher, that people referred to as Brother Dave, and he was awful. I mean, he was one of the... He was, uh, he was one of those TV preachers and, and so that we sort of make a caricature of. So he wasn't very good, but uh, our brother Dave is good. He's a good preacher. And, and thank you, Dave, for, for helping us think about the Lord's sacrifice for us this morning so well. But all the guys, thank you for leading us, and we're glad you're here. And my dad and his sister really enjoyed sitting around talking about family uh, and they often did so at this time of year you know when they were together more at holiday times and but really just about any time they got together uh, my father and my aunt Frida uh, they would talk about family and I remember as as a boy sitting and listening to them and trying to figure out what it was that they were talking about trying to follow um, as they sorted through relatives, and they had a lot of relatives, and, and how they were related, and you know how this second cousin twice removed was tied in with those relations in southern Tennessee, and how they all came from that great aunt's family in Pumpkin Center, West Virginia, and, and they would go on and on, and um, they seemed to know what they were talking about, um, and they seemed to have it figured out. And I really couldn't follow it very well. I had no clue, really. Um, and I tried. And I really wish I had got it because they're all gone now and it's sort of hard to, to, um, to know those old stories. But my brain just wasn't wired that way and still isn't. I have a hard time following family trees. I remember uh, you know, when I moved here, uh, about five years ago, it took some time to learn all your connections family-wise, and I'm not sure still that I've got it. Um, and, um, you know, getting to meet new people all the time, um, it gets more complex, com complex all the time, I guess. But family's important. And uh, names are important. And and how those names are tied together is important. You know, where they came from, how they got here, that kind of thing. And there's a lot of that in the Bible as well. Um, in the back of my office store, on the wall behind my office store, I have a, a Bible family tree that is quite extensive. And you can feel free to stop in sometime and see it, look at it. It's called A Family Tree from Adam to Jesus. And a lot of the information on that chart comes from our text this morning in the third chapter of Luke. Luke chapter 3, uh, verses 23 through 38. We have there a genealogy of Jesus. It contains 78 names. That's right, 78. 
So uh, be happy you're not asked to memorize Luke chapter 3. Some of those names are familiar to us as readers of the Bible. Some we've never heard of. They include the names, of course, of both Jesus and God. They also include famous Bible characters like Abraham and, and Adam and Noah. And then there's some not well-known uh, characters like Joram and Jonam and Neri. And, and the list just goes on and on from verse 23 through verse 38 of Luke chapter 3. And I would venture to guess that of all the passages in the Bible related to the birth of Jesus in some way, uh, this one is maybe the, the least preached on at this time of year. But you know me, I'm a little weird, so here goes. When Matthew lists the family line of Jesus, back in Matthew chapter 1, really to begin the New Testament, he traces the family from Abraham, the father of the faith, uh, the father of the Jews. He, he begins there and he traces it through to Jesus. So Matthew goes from Abraham to Jesus. But notice the different way that uh, Luke does it here in his gospel in chapter 3. Luke traces the family from Jesus to Adam. Or uh, we could say from Jesus to God. So I want us to look at this together for a couple of minutes this morning. He begins Luke chapter 3 verse 23. He writes, Jesus, when he began his ministry, was about 30 years of age. Now, this is helpful information to, to those of us interested in Jesus and, and interested in his work, isn't it? To, to learn when he began his public work. And only Luke, uh, the beloved physician, only Luke gives us this, this particular information that Jesus was about 30 when he began his public ministry. So he may have been you know, a little less than 30, may have been a little more than 30, he just says about 30. Isn't it amazing that he waited that long? Have you ever thought about that? Now, it would be just speculation as to why, and maybe not that helpful to us to speculate. Uh, some have said that, that 30 was the age of full adulthood, sort of in the opinion of the Jews at the time. Some have pointed to the, to the fact that, uh, that priests had to be 30 to serve in the temple according to the old law. Maybe there's some symbolism there. Some suggest that, that, that Jesus, it was more of a practical thing that he stayed in Nazareth taking care of his family for a long period of time because it's felt that uh, Joseph had died pretty early and that uh, Jesus as a result was sort of man of the house at an early age, we, but we really don't know why. What we do know is what Luke tells us, that he was about 30 when he began his public ministry. Now, what I find incredible is the fact that I think we would all agree that Jesus had the most important, the most significant, the most vital ministry in the history of the world to do. You know, to teach the new way of God. To give his life as a ransom for many. To go to the cross and, and to be raised from the tomb. And yet, he waited to start 
until he was about 30. He waited apparently until God said it was time to go. I've had some experience, along with many others, of training young kingdom workers in uh, both college environment and in internships and local ministry and that kind of thing. Young people who are interested in preaching or, or doing mission work or serving in the church in some capacity. And people who do that uh, know all too well how hard it can be to convince an eager young disciple to take their time and to prepare well for what they're about to do. To put in the work to be well prepared and equipped and to sort of wait on God's timing to go. That's a difficult task as trainers and teachers. And to get them to wait until they're out of their 20s, good luck. I'll just tell you from experience. But Jesus was about 30 with the greatest mission in the history of the world to do. So maybe that's an important thing for our young people to think about. Back in Luke's words there, Luke 3.23, Jesus, when he began his ministry, was about 30 years of age, being the son, as was supposed, of Joseph. Now, Luke reminds us as readers very quickly, doesn't he, that Jesus' birth was different from any other birth. You know, people suppose that his father was Moses, Mary's husband. But they would be wrong, at least strictly speaking, biologically speaking. Humanly speaking, Genetically speaking, Jesus was the son of Mary, of course. So yes, he was fully human, 100% human, fully man. He had a human mother who was the young virgin Mary. Legally speaking, in the Jewish law system of that day, yes, Jesus was the son of Joseph. Joseph was Mary's husband. Her child, in the eyes of the law, was his child. But what is most Im important, most essential, as Luke hints to us, when he says in verse 23, when he says this, as was supposed, what is most essential, he fully reveals later, at the end of the genealogy in verse 38. So yes, biology is important and legality is important, but the most important fact he saves for last. And that's where the context for our passage comes into play. I want you to look back in your Bible you're there in Luke 3 to what comes just before this listing of the ancestry of Jesus. Notice what it was. Before he starts into all the begats, all, all the names, we have John the Baptizer, Jesus' cousin. He's been out preaching in the wilderness. He's been baptizing many there. I want you to look at what it says in verse 21 of Luke chapter 3. It says, Now when all the people were baptized, and when Jesus also had been baptized and was praying, the heavens were opened and the Holy Spirit descended on him in bodily form like a dove. And a voice came from heaven, You are my beloved Son, with you I am well pleased. Here we learn what was most important about Jesus. Something 
so essential and so fantastic that God tore the heavens open when Jesus was baptized to speak so everybody could hear. Now, I loved when I was baptized, but he didn't tear the building open and rip open the heavens as scripture describes what he did when his son was baptized. He did for Jesus. And at that moment, we learn that Jesus was God's son, God's beloved son. And God also, importantly, was well pleased with his son. And then I'd also, talking contextually, point you to what comes right after the family line of Jesus in verses 23 through 38 of Luke. Right at the beginning of chapter 4, what do we have? We have the temptation of Jesus in the wilderness. Satan approaches Jesus and tries to entice him to reject God's will for him three times and remember each time how he prefaced his temptation by saying if you are the son of God so at the beginning of chapter 3 God speaks from heaven and proclaims to Jesus you are my son At the beginning of chapter 4, Satan questions whether he is the Son of God. And right in the middle of it all, verses 23 through 28, chapter 3, we have a family list which begins in verse 23 with the greatest name ever named, Jesus. Next Sunday, Lord willing, we're going to talk about that name. But it continues from that name through more than 70 others until we get to the end of verse 38 where it says Jesus was the son of Adam, the son of God. Son of Adam, son of God. Just six words but they hold so much meaning. Jesus was the son of Adam, descended ultimately from Adam, fully man. Jesus, you see, he descended not just from Abraham, who was the father of the Jewish race, although it is certainly true that that Jesus, the man, was a Jew. But this Jesus came from Adam, just like I did, just like you did. Jesus goes back to the father of the human race, which is the only race that really matters in the end. Now, folks, for a long time now, and it's only intensifying, this world is doing its best to teach you the most important thing in this world is your race or other categories like that. And that there are all these races and that we ought to be in conflict with one another. I'm telling you, the scripture says there is one. There is one. Paul said when he preached to the uh, Athenians on Mars Hill in Acts chapter 17, again, Luke is the author there. He tells us what Paul said in that brief sermon. One thing he said was this. Speaking of God, he said, And he made from one man every nation of mankind to live on all the face of the earth. From one. One man. That one man was Adam. Jesus is a son of Adam. 
Jesus, we might think of it this way, is related to everybody. All of us. Through Adam, he is one of us. But what makes him most worthy of our worship today is the other thing that Luke reveals here, and it's the last thing in this long list, and that is, of course, that he is the Son of God. Son of Adam, yes, but Son of God. That makes all the difference. The Son of God came to earth, took on flesh, lived as one of us, yet without sin. The Son of God taught us how to live, taught us about God, said things like, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Showed us what his kingdom would be like that he was bringing. And the Son of God went to the old rugged cross and he suffered and died there. In fact, he did so in our place. That was our spot on that cross. He took our place. He bore our penalty for our sin. He was innocent. The Son of God was then buried in a borrowed tomb where he stayed only three days before he was raised. Hallelujah. The Son of God right now is at the right hand of God, at the right hand of the Father on high, and he is awaiting his time once again where he will return and where he will judge the world in righteousness and where he will collect his church and take them to a place that he has prepared for them. Son of Adam, son of God. Do you believe? Have you responded? Are you living faithful to him? If this morning you need to make a change, either to commit yourself to him or to recommit yourself to him. You have a time now to, to come and, and ask for help, ask for prayers, ask for assistance. We hope you'll have the courage to do that. That invitation is, is open now, but it's open 24-7. And so at any time, you can make that choice to follow the one who came and died for you and now lives for you. If we can assist you this morning before we leave, we're going to sing this song to encourage you to think about it. Let us stand. Let us sing.